If you have a Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 1. Uh, we are studying Mark chapter 1 together. Uh, and so uh, we began this series last week. If you don't have a Bible, there are these Bible journals on the seats in front of you. And they're great. They are uh, great to write in, take notes in, and those kinds of things. So uh, they can be your companion as you go through the book of Mark with us. And I uh, encourage you to take one of those. That's our gift to you. If we run out, we'll buy more. Um, all of that kind of stuff. And, um, and so please take one and use it and bring it back with you when you come and all of those kinds of things uh, just to, uh, to kind of uh, help you along the way. But this is just a great way to, to keep track of what's going on in the book as well as uh, take notes notes and all that kind of stuff. Um, there is, uh, we're going to be, we're going to be in the book of Mark for the rest of this month. So for the month of October, we're going to be in Mark chapter one. And then Mark chapter one is actually going to lead us into a practice of Jesus that um, it, it's going to end with Jesus practicing something that we as a church want to learn how to practice and want to dive into and practice more. And so then we'll move into that practice for a few weeks. And then after that practice, uh, we'll head into the Christmas season. It's already here, y'all. You know what I mean? Uh, and we'll move into the Christmas season. And then after uh, Christmas, uh, starting in January, we'll jump back into Mark at Mark chapter two. And we will be in Mark indefinitely from that point. Okay, now we might take a few breaks here and there, uh, but it's probably going to take us 12 to 18 months to get through this book. Okay, so uh, it's going to take us a long time. Uh, and, and part of that is just because we want to do justice to it. We don't want it to be like a Bible study where like, hey, we take like one chapter a week and, and that sort of thing. I've been doing Mark uh, now every day in my personal study for about the last three months, and I'm only through chapter 12. Okay, so uh, I think I added that up. It makes up, you know, through chapter 12, we're at like 40 weeks or something like that. So, uh, so that, that can kind of be where um, you can kind of think through that. All right. So we're going through this very slowly as I showed you last week. Okay. Last week we started talking about John the Baptist and we started talking about baptism and the baptism of John the Baptist, which was done by John the Baptist, but then carried forward with the disciples all the way through the New Testament and uh, into the early church and uh, and those kinds of things. And, and really, uh, last week was an idea to try and help us understand a little bit more of biblically what does baptism look like from a biblical standpoint um, and, and not just give ourselves over to the definitions or the practices of baptism that we often have in evangelical churches uh, or even in, in ancient traditions throughout the centuries. But to look at it biblically and say, this is what the Bible says about baptism. This is how we should try and practice it, and this is how we should try and define it. Um, but, but in no way was trying to draw a line in the sand, okay? So like that was not the intent uh, of last week was to draw a line in the sand. It was just to truly give us a good biblical running definition for what baptism is and why it's an important aspect of disciples uh, and in the life of disciples and why we should um, engage in this if we haven't. And, uh, and what it means for us if we have. And so that's, that's really where we were going. But I only, because of that, uh, I, I, it was like 40 minutes long, um, and that was shorter than some of the times that I practiced it. So you guys should be happy. Uh, but, uh, but it was 40 minutes long, and all I really got to cover was one verse from Mark chapter 1, uh, for the most part, which was Mark chapter 1, verse 4, uh, where it says that John came baptizing uh, and was giving a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And that was basically kind of our launching point to talk about baptism uh, for the rest of our time together. So I want to cover some more of this section that we looked at a little bit last week, but we didn't get to cover it. Um, and then we're going to move forward into Jesus' baptism and Jesus' temptation, all right? And so uh, if you will, get out your Bible journal, your Bible, or whatever you have handy, and let's start reading verse 4, okay? John chapter 1, verse 4 says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Let's skip verse 6 because verse 6 is just about John being a crazy person. Uh, and then uh, verse 7 says, And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but, I, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So... <coughs> I want to just take a little bit of time to unpack this idea of what John the Baptist is talking about when he says, I baptize you with water, but there's one who's coming who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I want to just talk about that just for just a few moments, and then we'll kind of continue forward. But 
the thing about baptism of the Holy Spirit, we hear that terminology, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and oftentimes as 21st century people, we, if we have any understanding of the scriptures of the early church or Christianity at all, we oftentimes fast forward from Mark and go straight into the book of Acts. And we start thinking about Acts chapter 2 and uh, Acts chapter 10, and, uh, and we start thinking about these events. And we're going to fast forward, okay? We're going to fast forward there in just a minute. But before we fast forward, I want to rewind. Okay, because central to John's, John's uh, ministry is the fact that he's preparing the way for the Messiah. He's preparing the way for, for the Old Testament prophes- like prophesied Messiah. Okay, and so there is a messianic prophecy that is deeply rooted to what John is saying here in Mark chapter 1 that we can't overlook before we fast forward and go to Acts, okay? Because it's going to lay the groundwork for what John is really talking about and where John is really going. And, uh, and so John is referencing this messianic prophecy because uh, there are different prophecies, right? Some prophecies are just about the people of Israel and some are about what's coming or, or whatever the case might be. There are prophecies about, you know, being taken over by Babylon and, and Assyria and all these other kinds of things. Uh, so, so there are all kinds of prophecies, but this is a messianic prophecy specifically talking about Jesus and the Messiah. And so uh, Ezekiel 36, verse 23, we're going to start in the second half of thir- 23. Um, and uh, 23b through 28. Listen to this. It says, And the nations, this is the Lord speaking, so right before this, Ezekiel says, Thus says the Lord. Uh, but he says, The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land, and I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your God. Amen. Like, isn't that awesome? Like, that's just, that's one of those things that when you, when you read it, you, 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 what John is doing is he's enacting this messianic prophecy of where he is, he is doing the cleansing with clean water. And then he's saying that, but the Messiah is coming. He's going to put his spirit in you and he's going to change your heart of stone from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. Now, this is a really important thing for us to realize, especially when we start talking about baptism of the Holy Spirit, because a lot of times when we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, there, there are a lot of thoughts and viewpoints that that, that take this to a place of where it's all about miraculous signs and wonders. And that's, that's definitely seems to be a part of what begins to happen as the Spirit comes upon you. However, it is not, uh, it is not in every case just associated with miraculous signs and wonders. It's really more so associated. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is more so associated with taking hardened hearts and turning them into hearts of flesh that we might follow and discern and do the will of God. That's really what it's about. And so some of these other things are great things that come about through the Spirit, but they're not necessarily um, the, the whole the whole thing, not, not the whole thing that it's about. And so let's fast forward now, right? Let's fast forward to Acts chapter 2. Let's do that. Let's, let's go. We went to Mark. We rewinded to Ezekiel. Now let's fast forward to Acts chapter 2, right? You fast forward to Acts chapter 2, and you see this actually take place, this prophecy in Ezekiel 36. You see him gather people from the nations uh, and bring them all together in Jerusalem and in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit falls on them. And they begin to speak in tongues and hear the gospel in their own language. And, uh, and, and, and the Bible says this. The Bible says they were cut to the heart. Now, I love this terminology because when you think about the idea of cutting through the heart or cutting the heart, you, you, can't, you can't cut through stone. But the fact that they were cut to the heart means that their hearts have been softened in some way by the gospel that had been shared and by the Spirit's manifestation in that place, that their hearts have been started to be softened by the Spirit of God and by what was being said and by how the gospel was being proclaimed. And the reason why I say that is because 
Peter comes at that, and as he's preaching the gospel, what he says is he says, it's you who crucified him. You're the ones that put him on the cross. So not too long ago, people were, were yelling, crucify Jesus. So what does that mean about their hearts? Where were their hearts in that moment? They weren't very soft, were they? They're pretty hard toward the idea of Jesus and, and his life. And, and then you see that no, now there's something about this gospel that Peter is sharing and something about the spirit moving throughout these people that softens them in a way. And so they're, they're, they're cut to the heart and they say, what shall we do? And and Peter says, you know, repent and be baptized and, um, and then walk with the Spirit. The Spirit will be yours. And you can live and walk with the Spirit uh, for the rest of your life. And, and then, uh, and so this is just a fascinating way in which God is doing this in the people of Israel, um, as he said he would in Ezekiel 36. Now, that's, that's pretty cool, right? You get to see like, oh, there's a prophecy and then it actually comes true. I don't know if you guys think like, oh, that makes the Bible more believable, but it does for me, okay? Uh, so, um, but, then, but then, okay, let's, 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 not just, let's not just stop there though, okay? Because Jesus is about doing, doing something new. And one of the major things that he's about doing that's a new thing is about uniting all people of all nations, and in and, and, and impressing on and immersing all people in the Spirit. And so you fast forward to Acts chapter 9, and you see Saul kind of reborn as Paul in that moment where he becomes the, the guy who's going to go and carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles. But that's his mission, is to carry the name of Jesus to the Gentiles, and, and we see that he does that, right? He does that in Galatia, in, in Colossae, he does that in Ephesus, he does that in Rome, he does that in, um, he does that in Corinth. He, I mean, there's just so many places that he goes and he begins to be and, and lead people who are not of God's chosen people, not the people of Israel, into the family of God. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is, it's a really interesting connection on how, um, Luke connects Acts 9 of where we get this, uh, this guy who's appointed to carry his name to the Gentiles. And then very next chapter, right, after, it's, after it said that, 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 that Saul came to the other apostles and the apostles did not want to have anything to do with him at first because they were like, this guy's just been killing people. I don't know if we can really trust him yet. You know, like that whole thing. Uh, there's some skepticism on behalf of the other apostles. And, and Peter is skeptic. Uh, he's a skeptic, and uh, and and then and then you see the linkage between these two ideas in Acts chapter ten, where uh, where God comes to Peter and gives Peter a vision, and uh, Peter has this vision. What his vision is is uh, God says basically he gives him a bunch of different things, but but he says don't uh, don't declare something unclean that I've made clean, and. And that's a really important thing. And I don't, I don't know if Peter understands it fully in that moment, but then all of a sudden, the next thing we see in that chapter is that the centurion Roman soldier shows up at Peter's door saying, hey, um, you know, I've been seeking after the God of Israel for a little while. Uh, and I've, I, I really think that like, like so he's, he's already kind of been see seeking and, and searching out. Uh, and and he, it seems like he has some sort of understanding of the father, but he doesn't really know the son in the spirit yet. And, and Peter goes, oh, well, I think I know what this vision is about now. And he shares the gospel uh, with this Roman soldier. And before the Roman soldier can really uh, respond, the Holy Spirit again descends, kind of like it did in Acts chapter 2, does it again in Acts chapter 10, and this is just evidence to Peter that, oh my gosh, like God has chosen all people to indwell and immerse uh, with his spirit, and so what keeps these people from being baptized and being joined in the family of God and being called children of God? Nothing. Nothing. Now, this is such a powerful thing we can't miss about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what the gospel does, and uh, is that is that it is it is it is open to all people. And a lot of times we think about the gospel and we think, oh, it's, what it's about is it's it's about being and getting out of hell free, and th that is a great benefit. Uh, it's amazing, uh, but it, it's so much more than that. It's about it's about the people, like people, the diverse people, being a part of one family and being saved by the same God and being indwelled and immersed in the same Spirit to be empowered to live as the family of God amongst the nations, so that the world might declare the glory of God. That's what the gospel does. It's so much more than oftentimes we give it credit for, and we have to we have to grab a hold of the full nature of the gospel and live in it. 
live in it. All right? So, so this, is, this is what we see. And I think the question that I would ask, if I were sitting in that place, and the question that I try and ask myself even, but if I'm sitting there and I'm like, what do I do with all of this? And where do, where do I find myself in all this? I think I, would, I think I would just ask the question, has the gospel really gotten a hold of my heart in a way that it enables the Spirit to come and immerse me in a way that changes my life? Because that's really what the Spirit wants to do. But what you see here is there's a receptiveness and there's a softness of heart that's open and receptive to the gospel in a way that allows that to happen, allows that to take place. And I, would, and, and, and I don't even think this is a hard question to even gauge. Like you can just sit in your seat and ask yourself this question and know whether or not it's happening or not. Like are you the same Christian that you were three months ago? Are you the same Christian that you were six months ago or a year ago or two years ago? If, if, if the spirit, and I don't mean, I don't mean, have you changed your conviction, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, like, ha, ha, have, you, have you come to some new enlightened way of thinking about the God? No, I'm talking about, are you, you, you're still convicted that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, but is he actually, is he transforming your life? Because if he's not, like, the gospel is not being fully lived out in your life. There has to be not just an understanding of salvation, but actually salvation doing a work in us that leads us to be more like Christ. And so we have to, we have to understand this, and it's pretty easy to know whether or not our, we, we've actually been receptive enough to the gospel to let the Spirit come and change us in a way we can't change ourselves. All right, we're going to see what, we, what I mean by that in just a second as we get into Jesus' baptism. So let's turn back over to Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, as we get into Jesus' baptism, uh, it says this, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, with whom, or with you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. All right? So what we see here is Jesus being baptized. And it's interesting to think that Jesus was being baptized, right? Like, I mean, you think about John and what he was proclaiming that baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I think we would all hopefully agree, at least those of us who are followers of Jesus would agree Jesus didn't need that kind of baptism, right? Like, like he didn't need to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. But, but, there, but I'll get to why Jesus is baptized in just a moment as we continue. But I think there's an interesting thing that happens here. Jesus is baptized. He comes out of the water. And as he's coming out of the water, the heavens open up and the spirit descends on Jesus like a dove and, and declares the, the mouth of God, declares the voice of God, declares, uh, you are my son and with you I'm well pleased. This is, a, this is a really, really powerful moment, okay? Here's why. Because from what we can deduct from, from John, from, from, uh, other gospels like the book of John. John the Baptist knew that he was supposed to prepare the way for the Messiah, but he wasn't fully aware of who that Messiah was. Um, from John chapter one, we find out that like he didn't know or d wasn't aware of this until the spirit descends on Jesus at his baptism. And he's waiting for this moment. God has told him, God has said to him, there's gonna be a guy and I'm gonna anoint him. I'm gonna anoint him. Now, this is really important because the word Messiah means the anointed one. And so this is what John is waiting for. And when John sees Jesus anointed by the Spirit in the Jordan River and, and coming out and being anointed by the Spirit, he is now able to turn his attention from proclaiming that, hey, there is a Messiah who is coming to there is a Messiah and there he is. It's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Okay, so this is a really important and significant moment just for John the Baptist in and of himself. Uh, so that, there, there's one reason why it's important that Jesus is baptized. Here's another um, idea. 
um, that, that we have to pay attention to and we have to grab a hold of is that this is a significant moment because it's where the Trinity shows up in one place in the scriptures, which is oftentimes not seen in a lot of other places. But in this moment, we see the Father, and we see the Spirit, and we see the Son, so we know, man, this is a God-ordained and a beautiful moment in the Scriptures where these three things are coming together and manifesting themselves in in plain view. And so uh, this is how we believe, right? This is how we believe that God shows Himself and reveals Himself to us and the world is in three people, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. This is one of the major, major reasons why we why we have that theology and why we believe that and, and hold so fast to that idea, all right? Uh, but here's, here's another thing, all right? Another thing why Jesus is baptized that's really, really significant and important, okay? You cannot disconnect Jesus' story from the story of the people of Israel, okay? You cannot do it. Uh, if you try and think of Jesus outside of the context of Israel's culture and Israel's story, you're going to miss a lot. And one of the things that you see is that although Jesus is not uh, sinful, you see what he's doing is he's living out Israel's story by doing this, and he is identifying himself with a sinful people who have rejected their God in a major way. I talked about this a little bit last week, um, but but what Jesus is going to ultimately do uh, as he's led into the wilderness, he's going to retrace the steps of Israel, and he's going to do what they couldn't do. He's going to be what they couldn't be. Now, um, if you remember last week, I talked about the idea of baptism and how baptism is representative of God delivering his people through water. And one of the ways in which uh, it identifies that is with the, the people of Israel coming through the Red Sea. And, and the, the Egyptian people, which had oppressed them and held them bondage, are, are buried in those waters as they go out the other side to live and walk with God in the wilderness. And so Jesus is re-walking this story. He's going into the water and he's coming out and he's He's being led into the wilderness by the Spirit in order to show, like, I can actually do what they couldn't do. Let me show you what I mean. All right? In the wilderness, Jesus is there for 40 days. Um, and we find in, in other accounts of this uh, that Jesus was there for 40 days and he was fasting and praying. Um, and, um, and you think about Israel's story, they were in the wilderness for 40 years, okay? Uh, so they're, they're in the wilderness for 40 years, Jesus is in the wilderness for 40 days. So there's a correlation there uh, that, that we have to, have to grab a hold of and we have to understand. They're in the wilderness, Jesus is in the wilderness, there's a correlation that we have to understand there. They're there with cloud by day and fire by night, Jesus is being led there by the Spirit. There's a correlation there, okay? So there's a lot of correlations between these two things that are taking place. But here's the interesting thing is while Jesus is in the wilderness, it says that after 40 days of fasting, he was hungry. And so Jesus, this is great because it shows us Jesus' humanity, that he can empathize with us in every way. And, uh, and so he was hungry. He was, his flesh was weak uh, with, without a doubt. And, and he, was, he was hungry and, and he was in need and wanted some food, um, I'm sure. Um, much like many of us who are like, Derek, please be quiet so I can go eat Mexican in about 20 minutes, all right? Uh, but, but like the idea is, is that like he was hungry and his flesh was weak. And yet because he had spent those 40 days fasting and praying, as he was as weak as he had ever been in his flesh, but he was as strong as he had ever been in his spirit. He was as spiritually strong as he had ever been in that moment. And this is when the enemy comes. The enemy comes to tempt him. And this is the, the temptations that we see. There are three temptations, and, uh, and this is, they, they all correlate somehow to Israel's story and Jesus being the Messiah. And so it's really, really good stuff. But he says this, he, he, the first temptation is to turn stones into bread. All right, turn stones into bread. Gratify your flesh. Satisfy your flesh. Eat and satisfy your flesh. And Jesus quotes back Deuteronomy chapter 8. To, um, to the enemy, and he says, he says, a man does not live on bread alone, but he lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's Deuteronomy eight verse three, and um, and I think this is a really powerful thing because I think Jesus, what he's doing here is he's quoting a, a part of a scripture, but I think the whole of the scripture is really important. So look at verse two and three together, real quick. All right, here it goes. It says uh, in Deuteronomy two and three. 
or 8, 2 and 3, it says, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you be hungry. Look, look at this for a second, all right? So uh, I, think, I think we're already... Uh, yeah, let's, let's go back to the last slide real quick so that you guys have it. All right, but, but look at this for just a second. So he's there for 40 years. Jesus is there for 40 days uh, that you might humble you and test you. This word tempted in the Greek can also be translated tested. All right, it, it also could be translated tested. So we see this testing and what is being tested. Testing to know your heart. Uh, testing to know where your heart's at. Are you gonna keep the commands of God or not? Are you gonna keep my commandments or not? Right? And then it says, he humbled you and let you be hungry. Jesus is, is hungry. Jesus is hungry in this moment. And then it says that God fed you with manna, which you did not know. This was a weird kind of food that they had never seen or heard of before. It was a supernatural thing. Uh, he said, nor did your fathers know it, uh, that he might make you know that man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, so what, what uh, Moses is saying uh, is he's saying, look, God gave you the commandments uh, and he, he's tested you to see if you would keep these commandments as you went through the wilderness. If you were going to follow and obey these things, he tested your heart uh, to see these things. He even made you hungry to see if, 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 if that would uh, be, be something that would arouse uh, your, your flesh and, and, and you, just to see if you would trust him, if you would, if you would uh, follow him even in the midst of these difficult circumstances or not. And... Um, and he, and he did all of this, he did all of this to know whether or not you would, um, whether or not you would ultimately be his people, that you were meant and called to be. Now, this is something interesting that Jesus is doing, as he's, he's looking at Satan and he says, look, I, I um, am not going to be like the Israelites who after just a few days wanted to be back in slavery and was asking God to take me back to Egypt so that I could eat some bread. He, I'm, I'm stronger than they were. I'm, I'm able to do what they couldn't do because I, I am here to live out and live in the commands of God. His word is what I live by. I don't live by anything else. I don't live by anything else. But I live by his word and his commands alone. And so, um, so he doesn't need bread because he has the commands of God to nourish him and keep him going spiritually. Um, verse two, or, or the second, not verse two, but the second uh, temptation that you see Jesus engage with is throw yourself off of this building and see if God will save you. And this is, this is interesting because this is like a direct attack upon Jesus's identity. And I mean, just, just, just a few moments ago in the scriptures, he was baptized, came out of the water, and Jesus, or God said, you are my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so this is an attack, basically, against his identity of who God has called him and who God has said, this is who you are, and this is what you are to me, and this is how I feel about you. And, and, and so he goes in to attack uh, Jesus and say, prove it, prove it, jump off this building and prove it, right? He's, he's like, he's like, I'm sorry, um, but the, the Bible says, and, and the word says, do not put the Lord your God to test. Now, this is an interesting thing because it comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it's a part of the commands. It's a part of the law that Jesus has just said, this is what I live by, Satan. I live by these commands. That's, that's what I'm about. And so he's able to quote that right back. But here's the interesting thing, is that at every moment, at every moment, Israel continued to turn their back on God. They took no confidence in, in the fact that he had chosen them, that he had delivered them, that he had saved them, that he had brought them out. They took no confidence in their identity in which God had placed on them as his children and as his people, as his sons and as his daughters. They continually went against him and went against his way. And what Jesus is saying is, I don't question my identity. I'm not questioning whether or not God actually like, is with me or whether or not he actually sees me as a son or daughter. I find my confidence in the fact that he has said that I am his son and whom I'm well pleased. And so I don't put him to test. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Then, then the third one 
The third temptation is you can have it all right now. Just worship me. You can have it all right now and you don't have to die for it, Jesus. You have it all right now and you don't have to die for it. And Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6 again. He says that you shall not worship or you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And so, again, the law, the command of, like, I'm just going to worship God. It's the only God I'm going to worship. It's the only God I'm going to serve. is central to Jesus' uh, mindset. And you have to think about Israel and where they were, right? Time and time again, they turned and they worshiped other gods. They, they left and abandoned their, like, the God who had saved them and God who had rescued them, the God who had called them his children. They turned and they went in other ways. And, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 I'm not... I'm not going to do anything other than worship and glorify and serve uh, my God. And he's brought me here in the way that I'm called to worship and glorify him and serve him is to die on a cross. That's how, that's how Jesus is going to worship and how he's going to glorify and how he's going to serve God and do what he's asked him to do. He's going to die on a cross for you and for me. You see, in Israel's history, they, they chase after this kind of power and prestige. And God and Jesus, he doesn't chase power, he doesn't chase prestige, he just stays humble and gentle. And he and he goes not to or he comes not to consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but he takes on the very nature of a servant. And humbles himself to be obedient to death on a cross. See, he does everything that we can't do. He he does everything that they can't do. He is everything that they can't be. And he is everything that we can't be. See, you and I, we cannot, in and of our own power, change our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. Only he can do that. Only by the power of his spirit can he do that. And he tells us that in order to have his spirit, he must leave. He must leave. And it's better for him to leave so that his spirit can come. And so the way that he leaves is he dies on the cross and then he's raised from the dead, overcoming sin, overcoming the thing that oppresses us and and holds us captive. And he brings us into this opportunity for new life. Not where we can just go to heaven one day when we die, but where our lives can literally be changed and we can become new creations by the power of His Spirit. This is, this is what Jesus is doing, and this is what He's walking, and this is what He's symbolizing. When I said last week that this is not a, this is not a gospel about Jesus Christ, but this is a gospel of Jesus Christ, this is His gospel. This is His word to you and to me. This is his good news that he has to share. This is that that you and I can find salvation and hope for eternity, but we can also find new life in the Spirit. And we can do the things that Jesus is doing here by the power of the Spirit in us as Christians the power that raised Jesus from the dead, which now lives in us and has immersed us, we can push back temptation and say, you don't have any authority here, Satan. You don't have any authority in my marriage. You don't have any authority in, 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 in the way in which I, I lead my family. You don't have any authority in, in how I live my life. You don't have the authority to lead me down a wrong path. We have the ability, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to say that. By the power of the Spirit to look, like, look these demonic forces in our world, right? I mean, Paul says that we're not fighting a war against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against the spiritual powers of darkness in our world. And we have the ability, because of our, of our spirit um, stamp of approval, which... which we are given in Christ because that he has stamped us with his spirit and said that we are his sons and his daughters. We have the ability to say, no, you don't have authority here. 
And then any temptation that you're going to try and get me to move away from doing what God wants me to do or, or live in a way in which God uh, wants me to live, I can say no to that by the power of the Spirit. Now, in my flesh, I can't. If I'm living in my flesh, I'll say yes to Satan every single time. But if I'm walking in step with the Spirit, I'm walking in step with the Spirit, I can say no, no. I'm going to do the will of God. And that's what it says in Ezekiel, right? Go back to Ezekiel 36, and it says this. It says that I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. See, what the spirit allows us to do is be able to continue to obey and trust and follow God all the days of our life. Amen? That's the hope that we get to have and the hope that we get to share in when we take communion. As we come to the table each week, we're reminded of Jesus' broken body and shed blood that give us access to this spirit and allow us to have the spirit and walk with the spirit. And so I just pray, uh, my prayer for you, and it's been my prayer since uh, as I was preparing this this week, is that, that we would be humble enough we be humbled by the gospel, by the broken body and shed blood of Jesus in a way that the gospel really makes it possible for the spirit to change our lives. Because that's what, what, what's on offer. What's on offer is that not just that we get to go to heaven, but that we can be new creations. And we just have to be humbled by Jesus' death and love for us enough to walk in that way and take hold of that power and that life. So let's pray. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for just how you uh, tell your story and bring your story full circle and bring it all about in, in timely fashion, in powerful fashion, again and again and again. And, um, and so, God, I just... I just pray that your, your power, your spirit would, would truly invade our hearts and our minds and our life. I pray that we would take confidence in your broken body and your shed blood that, that has given us this access and this ability to come before you, approach your throne of grace with confidence knowing that you have been through everything that we've gone through and you are better at it than we are. And you've always been what we couldn't be, and you've always done what we couldn't do. And yet you, you submitted yourself to dying for us, taking on the death that we deserved. So gracious. So God, may we approach you now. Humble. Humble. Seeking after your spirit to immerse us, empower us, and call us forth so that no matter what we face, what we face, we may claim your authority over our life and you may change and transform our life through that and in that. God, we love you. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.